Welcome back to the Grace One Guild Book Festival. Thank you, Doyle Bueller, for our walk through strategy storming in your book. We're at 8.30 now. Welcome. Uh, I'm Rob Tyree, and we're going over to Ken Hubble, author, and he's focusing on people, artificial intelligence, teams. Ken, welcome to the Grace One Guild Book Festival. Rob, thanks so much. So, um, so I, I call myself a pragmatic futurist. Uh, basically, you know, since I got into design and, uh, and into the fields of business that I've been in, uh, I realized that uh, my my forte is I design for tomorrow, but I build for today. And uh, and one of the things that we have a challenge going for us right now is uh, tomorrow is today, and uh, so. Uh, we're, we're all of us are dealing with the repercussions of uh, this rapidly advancing AI and robotics world that we're in. And back in 2010, uh, I, I started speaking on the topic of talent disruption uh, from uh, an industrial standpoint. Uh, I was doing training programs for uh, the FAA and for uh, train air conditionings and, and, and train manufacturing uh, and a whole variety of other uh, industrials. And I realized that uh, there was a huge disruption starting to take place in uh, the workforce. And that was a challenge for most businesses to get their heads wrapped around when robotics was rapidly you know, coming into play. And uh, IoT, uh, Internet of Things, was allowing us to capture data in ways that we had never captured it before. Uh, you know, you talk about, uh, Doyle talked about the drift and how we course correct well, right now we actually have the ability to monitor just about everything we need. Uh, and well, not everything we need, but we have a ability to monitor a lot of the things that we need uh, to keep track of that will allow us to keep that drift from occurring and maybe forecast where it might occur if we're not even aware of it ourselves. And so that talent disruption that I talked about really came into uh, the forefront in my writing and in my career uh, when the Alexa came out. And I realized that from a training standpoint, we were going to revolutionize how we do training. And the training industry was going to change because you no longer had to memorize things. You can have a device that would allow you to recall things very quickly just by asking. Uh, and then you could also ask it other things. <clears throat> and you could do things verbally that you had to do typing, you know, that you had to type before. And so the whole concept of user interface was changing. And as I watched this snowball effect occurring, uh, I, I started putting together the outline for the book uh, that I wrote. And uh, so today I'm gonna share that, uh, share some bits and pieces from the book. Um, and I'm also gonna talk a little bit about, you know, the, the future beyond the book. So uh, a little background on myself. So I have a, a industrial design degree, uh, an educational technology master's, uh, and I am uh, both a consultant in the area of uh, Industry 4.0, Industry 5.0, uh, and just the whole aspect of building uh, the new team, uh, as we call it. And uh, I'm also the chief executive officer for Sophos.ai, uh, and we develop a platform uh, that allows people to uh, very quickly and easily uh, take control of their world and their integration of AI and uh, make it a part of what they're doing uh, from generative to uh, even other things. So uh, I'm going to share my screen here. And kick this thing off. So um, the book is There Is AI in and, uh, you know, I, I thought about this a lot. I thought about this back in 2017 when I started writing it uh, back November of last year when uh, a lot of the banks were slashing heads. They took out my entire department. And my wife said to me, finish the book. And I started finishing the book right as ChatGPT hit. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so the timing was just one of those moments in life where you go, okay, I'm pivoting my life, I'm pivoting my career, and, and I've got a couple of months here to write while I try to figure out what I'm doing next. Uh, I was already involved in the AI company uh, as an advisor and then as chief product officer. Uh, you know, always have a side hustle, that's my role now. And, um, and so 
you know, over the last year, once in, in, in November, uh, I, I spent basically nine months running the book. Uh, I came out in uh, late July. And uh, the book is, is, is all about the fact that it, this is not a technical book. This is an HR, uh, human factors, human resources type of book that just happens to have a whole lot of technology involved in it. And, uh, and, and it talks about the new team that we have that has been formulating for the last 20, 30 years now. And that is the team of humans, augmented humans, and, and robots and AI. And so um, the human part, everybody more or less understands what a human is. Uh, and the non-human part, the robots and the AI, a lot of people you know, understand what they are. They may not totally understand what's going on. But, uh, but they do understand what they are. The augmented human part is the interesting part to me uh, because that's where we bridge the two. And we have capability now of uh, literally creating the $6 million man, uh, which was a show back when I was a kid. So, uh, so today we are in a place where all of this is happening and it's happening at a pace that, that no one expected. And, and so adopting and adapting to this is, is is what this book is all about. It's it's how how do you play in this space and and stay ahead and and stay relevant, uh, but also not panic in the streets. And I'm going to try to get my slide. There we go. All right. So let's start off with the human factor. So you know, for centuries, uh, you know, we've been in this in this world of uh, just us. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, for millennials. Uh, you know, we, we, we've been just us and, and humans do really cool things. Uh, we've built some amazing things uh, without the aid of AI. Uh, I mean, we built the pyramids. We built, uh, you know, we, we've created symphonies. Uh, we've, we've painted, you know, the Mona Lisa and, 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 and you know, other major works of art. Uh, we, we cook. We create. That's what we do. Uh, every day we create. Uh, even the process of procreation is something we as human beings get a chance to do that's fairly unique, not not to speak, you know, not not to living species on the planet, but uh, when you compare it to, you know, robots. You know, two robots don't meet on the street and have a baby robot. Uh, you know, it just doesn't happen. So we also create robots and AI. The 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 thing will you know, the, I think the underrated thing that's happening right now is that uh, there's a tendency to forget we built robots and AI as a part of the collective uh, you know, creativity of programmers and designers and, and everything else. Chat GPT would not exist if it wasn't for us. And so when you think about what we offer, we offer creativity and inquiry. I mean, when, you, when, when kids wake up in the morning, they go, I wonder why the sky is blue. You know, a robot doesn't do that. AI doesn't do that innately. I mean, we may eventually teach it to ask that question, but it doesn't do it innately. Um, we are empathetic by nature uh, and caring, at least most of us are. Um, uh, we, can, we can lead, we can have strategy. Uh, going back to, to Doyle's part about the strategy part. Yeah, that, that's a uniquely human factor at this point. We, we don't have AI designing true strategy. Uh, we can provide ethical judgment and morality calls. Uh, are they always right? No. But we have the ability to do that, and it's a part of the human wiring that takes place. Um, we also have the ability to dream and imagine. Now, if Philip K. Dick uh, another writer, if it actually comes true and, and uh, androids do dream of electric sheep, uh, then, you know, we, we take a shift into a different direction. We have to kind of deal with that. But for what we are right now, we're the dreamers. We're the ones that imagine what's coming next. And in my book, I cover this aspect of how we evolved as human beings to be this, uh, this collaborative creative species um, that has been able to create and, and achieve so much. Um, even with all the things that are that are negative that are happening right now, the positive things that are happening are amazing. Uh, we have made huge strides in medicine and in, uh, you know, even just addressing the fact that, you know, 
we we know that there are things going on on the planet that we need to course correct for. And so, uh, you know, our ability to recognize our own foibles is another issue, uh, you know, like the spelling issue that, that, that Doyle was talking about from AI. AI is doing some amazing things, but if it can't even recognize that it misspelled its own words, then, uh, then, then that's where the collaboration comes into play. And uh, so I think that, you know, the challenge that we as human beings have in this case is recognizing the things that we do that are important and that we have the capability for doing. And so I cover those things in my book. The book is a collection. There's in, in, in the first part of the book, there's a collection of stories, scenarios of different ways that all of this is taking place and impacting the lives of others. Um, and then over the next 13 chapters, uh, I cover all the different facets of at least where, where my lens and my perspective was at the time of how this is impacting and also the actions that we can take as human beings to uh, to appreciate it and to also work with it and make it you know, uniquely ours and uh, to, 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 to better the world around us. So one of the key things that I recognized early on is that we need to treat AI and robotics as partners, not as replacements. There's been, I mean, all the way back, there's a couple of Twilight Zone episodes that were really interesting. Uh, but one has the the Robbie the Robot character uh, that comes in and it's going to replace the guy on the assembly line. And then the next thing you see is that he's taking over other parts of the operations. And eventually the manager at the top thought that they were immune to it all. Uh, gets taken over. And now the robots are running the robots. And I think that, you know, while, you know, Rod Sterling and, 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 and others at the time, you know, were painting a picture of, of, of warning for us, I think they were missing the important factor that the AI and the robotics, without direction from us, there's no point. You know, one of the things I point out in the book is this is a zero sum game to some degree, okay? If companies employ robotics and AI to the point of the exclusion of any humans working, there'll be no humans left to buy the products that they're making. So what's the point? And so when you look at the, the advantages to having AI as a partner and not as a replacement, um, there, there's a lot of facets that come into play that, that uh, some are obvious, some are not. Uh, robots can do things that are more dangerous than than human beings can do, uh, which is great because I don't want to stick my hand into a furnace. Uh, you know, I don't. I would rather have a robot running, you know, the the changing out of the core of a nuclear reactor than me. Uh, you know, that's just just you know just from a safety standpoint. Um, they can also physically do things that we can't do, but I'm going to talk about that a little bit a little bit in the next couple of slides that, that that may not be always the case um but it can also think they, they can also do things faster so some of the things that are happening right now with chat gpt and generative ai and things like that is that yes the robots can do things faster when given the right direction and and and, and achieve some really amazing things so let them let them do the stuff that you want to get done quickly. So coming out of the training world, uh, as I did, uh, one of the challenges that we were always faced with is that every year, especially in the banking industry, regulatory, um, mandated regulatory training was 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 always a factor. Uh, you know, the regulations change in the industry, we have to get it out there quickly, and people have to be able to keep doing their jobs. And the problem is that regula regulations would come out. It would take us, you know, four to five weeks to build a course and actually get it published out there. And then people had to take it. And by that time, it was, you know, people may have already made mistakes, may have missed the boat, uh, you know, for what they needed to learn. Wouldn't it be great if we could do that faster? And so with AI, uh, one of the, the modules that we have in our, the platform that my company sells uh, is called Micro Lesson. And it literally can create a five to seven minute micro lesson uh, given a certain amount of subject matter 
that you that you supply to it uh, in, in in a variety of forms, and uh, it takes about ninety seconds to create the entire course, and uh, you know that used to take forty hours, maybe eighty hours to create by the time you went through it. And it may not be perfect right out the gate. It probably gets you 90% of the way there and then you'll go through and you'll tweak it. You may add some additional materials. Uh, there may be some work to get it into whatever format you need to have it in. But the point is, is that that 80 hours that you used to take before is now 90 seconds. And so that to get you to that rough draft for something that was basically a page turner course in the past anyway, uh, is a huge gain for a company that needs to keep up and keep, keep pace. Um, the key is delegation. You know, again, we're not replacing, we're delegating. Um, back in the day, people used to have secretaries or assistants that would do, you know, a lot of the writing and, 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 and the paperwork that you have to have done in a company. Well, now you can have AI or robotic process automation do that for you. And that frees up a whole ton of time of things that you didn't necessarily want to be doing anyway. Or maybe you weren't good at it. Maybe you're a great leader, but you, you, you're a terrible writer. So you pass it on. Somebody else writes the draft. They send it back to you. You then read it and approve it. Well, you can do that with AI now. And it's effective and efficient and a, way, and a great way to do that. So the goal is to work with them. Uh, you know, treat them like they're human beings, but remember that they're not. You know, if you were going to delegate something to a human being before, and now you don't have a secretary because they took those secretaries away, or you don't have that assistant because, hey, everybody can read their own emails. But now you have an opportunity to use, you know, the, the, the technology to help you out. Um, and remember that they do what you ask them to do not what you want them to do always. And so uh, my son's a, an anthropology student and he's been working with our technology uh, from, from a research standpoint, not to use it to do the research, but researching the actual platform. And he said, one of the interesting things that's come out of it is that his ability to communicate with human beings has gotten better. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, he said, Sophos Chat only does what I ask it to do. And if I don't ask it very well, it doesn't do what I really wanted it to do. So I've gotten much more articulate in the way that I, and precise in the way that I ask my questions. That's helped me with my peers. That's helped me with people I work with. That's helped me with my professors. And it's, you know, I had, he said, I had a professor actually come to me and say, I don't know what you're doing, but over the last two months, your ability to articulate yourself in class has improved, you know, a magnitude. And I think that we have an opportunity for, for managers and for other people in organizations to take advantage of this uh, you know, kind of subconscious coaching that happens as a result of this uh, to get better at who we are. Um, the other thing that's fascinating, and, and if you've not tried this, try it. It's, a, it's an interesting experience. Uh, it's also teaching us to be more polite, or it has the opportunity to teach us to be more polite to each other. Uh, the, the technology, the way it works, is based upon all the data that it was gathered and where the sources of the information came from. So if you are polite and, and, and have a positive conversation or a positive request with the generative AI, you will get a different set of results than you will if you are mean to it. Uh, and that's another, another one of the experiments my son was doing. And so uh, try it sometime. Remember your pleases and thank yous. Um, you know, and then if you if you don't use please and thank you, if you're mean, you say just get this done. You know, you will get different results. And I think that that's a fascinating, you know, byproduct of the fact that we have this this uh, artificial intelligence that may actually help us be better human beings. So, um, so let me go to the next one. This is where it gets really interesting. So a lot of people focused on robots and AI, and a lot of people focus on the human factor, but we are in a world where human augmentation is now mainstream. And 
that is a very cool place to be because people who uh, have been living with, uh, I, I don't think we can call them disabilities anymore, anymore but challenges in their lives uh, due to whatever conditions they have, uh, physically, mentally, uh, even I, I would go, to, go so far as to say eventually, you know, social, social economics. Uh, but as far as the human augmentation part, we've had the ability to do glasses. Glasses was human augmentation, like 101. Um, then we had uh, early forms of prosthetics, which were they they helped people, but they didn't they didn't transform their lives from the standpoint of making them back to being human beings. Uh, you know, there was always a stigma to it. Uh, we've had pacemakers. Now, pacemakers started off in one way, and then they uh, then they became much more sophisticated. Now, people are monitoring them under under cell phones and and things like that. We've had artificial hips and joints and replacements. We now have uh, you know some some fairly sophisticated things happening in other aspects of biology. We have kids that if they you know were born with birth defects that had no arms, able to have really cool robotic prosthetic arms now. And instead of doing like you know the the energy you know the the, the green uh, movement did with the Prius. And, and, and made a car that no one wanted to buy because it didn't look good. Instead, they built the Tesla version of the arms and the hands. And so you have kids that are able to go, you know, one day they were the, they were the kid that people picked on because he didn't have an arm or, you know, was challenged. The next day, the kid comes in and he's Iron Man. Okay. Literally Iron Man. And that's an amazing thing. That is a leveling of the playing field. And at this point, those arms are set to be at human level or below, just a little bit below. But there's nothing that says Johnny won't be able to later on in life crank that puppy up and throw a 120 mile an hour speedball, you know, fastball. Um, and that's when things are going to get really interesting. So there are several companies out there doing this in a variety of fashions. So you have Open Bionics; they do the 3D printed arms. Uh, Autobot does uh, exoskeletons that uh, enable people to uh, literally hold an engine up under a car while they're bolting it in place. Uh, this is a human being with an exoskeleton around them, kind of like what happened uh, with Ridley Scott's Aliens. <laughs> um, you have Sarcos, which has a fully energized exoskeleton suit that uh, <laughs> I, I, just, I was watching one of the videos. It was just amazing watching some of the stuff these people can do. Uh, Naked Prosthetics makes it to where uh, you can, e I shouldn't say easily, but you can replace the use of your fingers if you lose them in an accident. Uh, Neuralink is, is, is Elon Musk's thing with the uh, to tap into the human uh, nervous system. Um, eSight allows you to, uh, it, it scans the room in front of you and turns what you're seeing into audio so that if you're blind or you're, you're hard of seeing, you, know, you can actually get a description of what other people are seeing. Um, motion Savvy um, does a thing where they, uh, it, it does dynamic uh, voice translation. Uh, bioprinting. You've got multiple universities that are now printing organs, literally hearts, livers, uh, skin. Uh, it, it, it is just fascinating what's happening. And this is, again, just the tip of the iceberg. And so uh, some exciting things happening to keep aware of. Uh, you know, the world is not just about... AI and robotics, it's about us and how we're taking advantage of those and using those in, 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 in what we're doing. <clears throat> uh, one thing I just noticed is I am totally washed out on the screen because the sun is actually in full view right now. So we'll just roll with it. Um, so how do we get everybody ready for this? Because this is happening. You know, 
<laughs> now, Luddites beware. It is definitely here and it is coming to play. And if you're not ready for it, um, you're going to miss out. So education and future prep. We have got to get, you know, kids, you know, part, part of the, you know, there's a, there's a, a section in the book that is all about leveling the playing field. And, and, and that's what we're doing effectively AI and robotics. I think one of the reasons why a lot of companies, a lot of people are worried about AI and robotics is that it's leveling the playing field. Okay. If you've got great ideas and you're creative and you have dreams and passions and goals in life that you want to do, but you don't necessarily have the skills to do it yourself and you can't afford to hire somebody else to do it for you. You don't have to anymore. You can use AI to do a lot of that. You can use robotics to do a lot of that. And that's that's a leveling that's that, that, that we haven't seen to the degree that we're talking about here. And in order to take advantage of it, we've got to have people growing up learning how to quickly adapt and adopt the technologies and the capabilities as quickly as they can. And you know that needs to happen at almost birth at this point. And it's, and it's going to transform the way we do education because it's a shift from memorization and test taking to discovery and question, asking questions. You know, one of the great things about AI is you can ask AI the same question 20 times and it does not get ticked off at you. But if Susie asks her teacher 10 times in a row, why is the sky blue? At the fifth time, the teacher's probably ready to blow her brains out because she's got 23 other Susies in the class asking the same question or a different question and they all want the answer and they're looking, you know, looking for that. Well, between AI and uh, you know and, and and the other technologies that are now available, they can discover it for themselves. And not only that, but the AI, at least something like what, what our platform does, can have a Socratic model in it that actually, actually instead of answering the questions, asks a question back to the student in a Socratic way, so that the student discovers the answer themselves. And, and it drives that bigger picture. So training and education in this space takes on a new dynamic. Do we want everyone to be a programmer? No, that's one of the reasons why natural language processing and the new type of interface that we're dealing with is, is so powerful. Um, do we need programmers? Absolutely. But that, that's also where the technology comes into play because it can do things like check your code. It can write sample <laughs> code or templates and things like that. So there's all sorts of, of things that are coming out of this. And in the book, I cover you know, a whole swath of, of types of jobs, of types of opportunities that we're preparing the, the students for that, um, that haven't been there. They, they, those jobs weren't there two years ago. The other thing that's happening is that we're switching to this mode of lifelong learning and continuously reskilling ourselves. And again, that's something that some people are comfortable with, some people are not. And we need to help build that, that uh, curiosity and that ability to be flexible and be a little bit ambiguous with your life. You know, going back to, to Doyle's comment about the drift, if you set your, your, your goal too far out, you're gonna drift by nature because it's no longer gonna be a valid goal. Potentially, um, you know, after a few years now, because things are changing so rapidly, you know, are some goals important that don't shift? Yeah, altruism, uh, being a good person, you know, you know, having a family, whatever the case might be that you, that, that, that those, those types of goals, those probably don't change. But how you're going to get there absolutely is going to change. And that's, that's the mind shift that we have to have. And companies need to be able to do that as well. They need to be able to pivot rapidly. Now, fortunately, again, we can leverage the technologies to support those efforts. And so you have an opportunity to, to, to use AI to help you forecast where you need to go. <clears throat> but the key is this, it's no longer just the educational institution's responsibility or the family's responsibility 
or uh, you know your own personal responsibility to to make this happen. It has to be a collaboration between employers, high schools, community colleges, universities, everybody working together to to formulate this plan because it's no longer I'm going to school for twelve years, then I'm going to college for another four years or you know tech school for two years, and then I'm going to go get my job. It's got to be interwoven. And so I think we're going to see a rise of apprenticeship programs uh, that they're already starting to, 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 to come on the rise. I see you're, I think you're going to see space learning happen where you go to school for a little bit, then you go to work and apply that, try it out, see if it's actually going to work, see if it changes in the next six months, and then you go back to school. And it's just constantly evolution, you know, this constantly uh, changing and adapting and evolving uh, platform for everyone to become skilled uh, for the future. So, um, so here's the big one. So everybody's concerned about AI ethics right now. Uh, you flip through LinkedIn or the news feeds from just about anywhere. Everybody's worried about AI ethical uh, issues. It is the what I call the AI elephant in the room, and uh, and and it is a very important thing. I mean, hands down, yeah, ethics have to guide what we're doing. Because one of the things, like with human augmentation, Johnny comes to school and he's got an Iron Man arm and he's now able to do things that other kids can't. What's to keep Billy from slamming his arm in the door of a car to injure it so he gets it replaced with the bionic arm that Johnny has? And what does that mean? <laughs> so that's that that could be a very uh, interesting uh, set of, of conversations that we're going to have. Uh, you know, we're already seeing this happen in sports right now. Uh, I'm not going to get political, so I'm not going to not to go down this path. But I will tell you, there are policies and things being questioned right now because we have literally been able to transform our human bodies and. Uh, become something we weren't before. And that is making the, the playing field not level anymore. And it is it is you know, challenging some of the ways that we think about things. Um, so when it comes to employment, okay, if I go in and I use Alexa, and I'm very good at using Alexa to do my job, whatever it is, um, and I'm competing against someone who is going by rote memorization based upon what they learned in school uh, five years ago that may not be relevant anymore. And I am being asked in interview questions, and they are too, and I'm asking Alexa for the current information, and the other person doesn't know about Alexa or doesn't know how to use Alexa. It's just going by memory. Um, who is better suited for the job? If you're just going based upon skills and competency and ability, um, I don't know. I, that, that's a question that's out right now because that is a challenge that people are going to have. Those who know how to use AI and the technology are going to take the jobs from those who don't. That is just my personal opinion. And uh, and I've seen it in other sources as well. But that is that is what is happening. People who can use the technology effectively and not use it to, to just replace themselves, but use it effectively, are going to do better than those who don't. Um, and so uh, the other thing is bias. And there, there's a whole other set of factors. I mean, there, there's lots of things in the ethics aspect of things in the arena for it. But bias is another thing uh, that I talk about. And one of the things to realize about bias is this. Everything is biased. <laughs> if if you think that AI is not going to be biased, then you're misleading yourself. Everything in the world is biased. And I'll give you an example. When I was a kid, I walked into my house one day and my mom was making stuffed cabbage. Never had stuffed cabbage before. And at that point, when I stepped in the house and smelled how bad it smelled in the house, I said, I didn't want to. I said, what is that smell? That is disgusting. And so I got crackers for dinner. And my rest of my family ate the stuffed cabbage. 
Now, I was given an opportunity to have a taste of it. Um, and guess what? It was awesome. And I said, can I have more? And my mom said, no, you get crackers. <laughs> and, but my bias because of the smell when I walked in made it to where I didn't know what I was missing. Okay. And we do this with a lot of things. If, if, if someone says, you know, we're going to go get sushi. I don't like raw fish. Well, if you've never had raw fish, but you're just going based upon your perception. And then you go in and find out, hey, sushi is pretty good. But you would have missed it if you hadn't gone with the other people that you went in with. Um, you know, it, it, is the sky blue? That's another one. Is the sky blue? Well, what shade of blue? Uh, you know, and, 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 you know, based upon your physical conditions, you're going to perceive a different blue than somebody else. So we are all biased in various ways. AI is going to be biased as well, because whoever puts the data in, whatever the sources are, are going to drive that bias. Right now, these large language models are based upon the collective knowledge of the human, you know, all, all the humans that it drive, you know, it collected it from. So that's the classics. It may go back to you know, all the way back to Egyptian times as we're reading hieroglyphics in. So what is that, what does that mean? You know, well, it means that we've got all the biases that have happened throughout history. And that means that you know, subjects today that we think are bad and topics today that we think are inappropriate or, 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 or cruel or, or wrong or good for certain people, that's because there were writings that, worked, that, that were brought into play when they, they, they brought together all this knowledge that impacted the way that the large language model treats language. And in order to not have that, that means that we have to say, okay, we're going to start off with a clean slate and we're going to feed in information that is not biased. But who determines what is not biased? Who is setting up the guardrails for this? Because whoever's setting up the guardrails is using bias from today to determine what that is. So as we start, as we, as we think through these broader ethical concerns from a business standpoint, so Isaac Asimov wrote three simple rules you know, back in the 50s on robotics. The first one is the most important one. An AI, or, or in, this, in his case, he said robot. A robot shall not harm, I'm going to paraphrase here, but harm, injure, or kill a human being. Okay. Now, if AI and robotics become part of boards of directors, there is already an AI CEO. So, uh, so if they become a part of the board of directors, and a corporation is getting ready to launch a new initiative. And that new initiative could harm human beings somewhere in the world as a result of what they do. The manufacturing process, you know, the, the use of labor, whatever the case might be. And someone on the board is an AI that has to follow that law of thou shalt not harm another human being. Or, you know, shall not harm, harm a human being. Does that change the dynamics of the decisions that the board is going to make? And will they be able to actually do the initiative that would harm someone? That is going to change the way, fundamentally change the way we do business if we go down that path. And that's a challenge that we're going to have to face. So, so when you think about all the impact of this, you know, there is a huge thing going on here, and it is called humans augmented humans and non-humans collaborating together to make a difference and to do great things in the world if they are allowed to and so i wrote this book this was the original cover <laughs> the, the the one of the slide at the beginning was when i ran it through dolly three and said take my cover and now amp it up about twelve thousand degrees and uh, and it generated the other one. Uh, the QR codes are to the site where you can get the book on Amazon. It's also available on Kindle. Um, I think we are on the forefront of an amazing time for human beings. And we have just barely scratched the surface of how all of this will impact us, uh, how we will be able to do things that we've never done before. Uh, you know, 
and and we're heading to the stars. So what better uh, emissaries for us than robots who can go out without injury or or risk for us and pave the way for us to then get there. And how much more can we do here on Earth if we're uh, taken away from the mundane and the dangerous and the 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 the, the you know non uh, you know the non value add if you want to call it that jobs and shift that work or shift those people to doing creative work and 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 and, and engaging work and meaningful work that. Uh, can truly transform the lives of everyone on the planet. I, I, I think we are on the, the, the dawn of something great. And, and I hope that other people follow suit with that. So um, so I'm Ken Hubble and uh, happy to, to you know handle questions. And uh, if anybody wants to reach out to me, uh, feel free. Ken, great job. And uh, thanks very much. Thanks for leaving time for questions as well. And uh, what a super look and taking a step back at a mix of your journey and uh, the creation of this book. It uh, looks super accessible. I know that uh, we wander around and we think that there are 100 million people doing this every day and uh, they don't. And uh, we look at productivity numbers and uh, some of the surprises we see in the press. We know that education is important. You're laying it out here. But uh, I'm going I'm to switch you back, though. I know you're a movie guy. I'm a movie guy, but I'm not going to talk about movies. First computer. Tell me about it. Ah, uh, what? Yeah. Yours. The yeah. First oh, my first, my first computer. Oh my God. Uh, TRS-80 model one. Uh, I did a, uh, a Pulsar simulator in 1978, uh, for a summer computer camp. Yes. I was the ultimate geek as a child. So, uh, so I had a lot of fun with that. Long journey. So I know uh, I've hired thousands of people and uh, lots and lots of programmers. They always remember their first program. And I can tell if someone is really a technologist, if they can tell me about why they were passionate about their first program, <laughs> then we can start. But a book well, is like a program too. Yeah, I, 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 wrote, I wrote that program because I was interested in space. It was a summer science camp thing. I was interested in space and and uh, I've been doing a lot of reading in science fiction about you know you know uh, black holes and things like that. And I learned about pulsars that summer, and I wanted to show people what a pulsar actually did. And so I did a simulation of the way a pulsar works on a on a trash model one. <laughs> of course you did. Of course you did. Uh, I was an Amiga five hundred guy, the first one I bought with my money, but I forced my dad. In yep. 1984, 83, 82, 82, to buy a, a PC clone because my friend was building him at the same time as Michael Dell was building them in the same dorm room, ah. one in <clears throat> Guelph and one in Austin, Texas, right? So uh, on AI tools, right? So this is a, you're in it, you're on it, yep. uh, you're introducing people to AI in their jobs. What are the top three tools that you think people should be using today or trying today? Oh God! I, let's it, not let us pick any of the general chatbots. Pick something else. Uh, well, they definitely should use ours. It's it's Sophos.ai. Just go to it. It's free. You can start playing with it. Uh, you can you know pay to do some more advanced things, but uh, but it's 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 available. Um, and it's it and it's a modular system, so it allows it's like Lego blocks for for natural language processing and uh and 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 generative AI. So, uh, so you can build some really cool things with it. Um, let's see other ones, uh, toss up between Dolly three and mid journey. Um, I saw, I saw a, a, a neat one yesterday. Uh, I think it's Leonardo.ai, which has some, some interesting controllers and features to be able to adjust style better than, than the, the platforms themselves. Um, uh, uh trying to think uh synthasia uh i've followed them for a while they've got a nice platform for creating synthetic characters and and, and avatars uh it, it takes a little bit of time <clears throat> it's not instantaneous it takes like five days to get your your persona you know generated but once you have it um it it always looks good 
and it has your voice and it's 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 really kind of neat it, it's funny because back in uh back in 2008 i was working with a guy uh formerly from a company called lips inc and uh they had done some tools for uh some of the game engines and lips inc did real-time voice uh, uh both uh, both generation did uh, generation of the voice but it also did the lip syncing and I ported that to a platform uh, out by Adobe at the time called uh, Macromedia Director. And so I had real-time 3D characters talking. And, and at the time, there was a debate between, I want to say it was Bill Clinton and George Bush. And I was able to switch their voices. So you had Bill Clinton talking with George Bush's voice and George Bush talking with Clinton's voice. And that was that was pretty hilarious. So uh, so today it's even it's even more fantastic because you can literally uh, I, I we could take what I'm doing right now and have me speaking uh, in a foreign language, uh, which is which is really neat. So there's uh, uh, as far as the big boys, uh, you know, Deep Minds uh, you know, got got a lot of a lot of activity going on. Uh, uh, Google's Gemini is just hitting the, hitting the ground right now. Uh, the cool thing about our platform, we're we're large language model agnostic, so we can plug in anybody's, and uh, and it doesn't affect your your programming stays the same. It's just you know the the results start coming out differently. Uh, so Gemini is still in I would say beta, <laughs> uh, you know, and we are the beta testers, and uh, you know, meaning everybody, all billion people on the planet, <clears throat> and that's how they evolve. Uh, you know, that's how these these things get better. Uh, uh, there are some interesting ones. I th there are the big ones. You you know you point out the five, but there's also ones like Bloomberg has an LLM uh, for financial data. Uh, the Mayo Clinic's working on one. Um, a lot of the universities are working on their own for their specific corpus of of information. And so I think that you're going to see some fascinating things coming out with what we call finite language models, which are smaller, more precise, and they're focused on specific industries or, or niches. The great thing that I think is going to come out of all of this, and, and I used to talk about this, my dad was in data processing, so I used to talk to him, you know, a, over a decade ago. I said, what we really need is a way to take all the knowledge that everybody has in their discrete uh, uh, corpuses of information and make it to where if I ask a question and this industry over here or this 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 information over here is related some way to this information over here but in the normal stretch of human conditions would never meet and would never align this is the way we can do it because the AI can help find those connections that we as human beings couldn't because the vastness of all the information. To me, that is that is the ultimate of where we're going. And I, I don't think a single large language model is going to do it because it's just too much. It slows down. Uh, it, even uh, the GPT-4 Turbo right now is running a little slower than the GPT-3.5 or 4. So, you know, there's trade-offs to this stuff. I think that, you know, you're going to see a, a combination of those things. Uh, there's some there's some neat video stuff going on right now. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the product. Uh, and I'm drawing a blank. Uh, Canvas uh, has got some really neat tools. My my kids, have, my one of my my daughters uh, uh, in, in uh, marketing, and she uses it. It's got some neat tools in it for doing automated stuff. You know, Photoshop obviously, uh, Premiere, uh, but there's also you know there there are plugins coming out for those every day that do some, some fascinating things. So my, my, my hint to everyone is if you think that you know the best product today, you're wrong because it just changed. That's great. Hey, so, <clears throat> so how do you, uh, you know, you, you're well-informed, you're on top of it. Uh, great off the top of your head suggestions, just 12 of them. That's all. Uh, so how do you stay up to date on some of the things that you think are most important in impacting your audience? So uh, a podcast or what types of like three things that you know that every week you definitely look at to give you some help and guidance in informing you? Um, 
I've set myself up to follow the big five, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some other resources out there, but I, you're going to laugh when you hear this one. So I have a blog and the blog has, it, it's it's set up with categories that basically are just indexes to links to, to papers and videos and articles and things like that. Um, my father, who is retired, um, got fascinated by this stuff that I was doing. And so he is, he just constantly goes out. He got, he, he was, he was emailing him to me. I said, this guy, stop. I'm getting like a thousand emails from you a day. And, and he was like, okay. He said, what can I do? I said, you can be the curator for my blog. And so he literally goes through and on a regular basis is categorizing these things and putting them into it. So if you want a categorized version of all the stuff that's coming in, if you go to the blog, that's uh, there, there's a, a, a link in the, uh, uh, in the book, there's a there's a link, and I think and you're gonna put a, you're gonna put a link in the chat as well. But go ahead. Uh, but but the, the the beauty is is that you go there and it's categorized. So if you want to learn about ethics, there's an ethics category. If you want to learn about uh, how it's affecting 21st century education, there's one for that. And then when you go into there, it's all a list of articles that you can go to, uh, because there's so much stuff coming out about this every day. And, 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 you know, you need somebody to help you. Eventually you can use our platform. You know, if you want to write a little bot to create, uh, you know, a list of things going on, uh, it might be able to keep up. Uh, it literally is, you know, people are publishing papers and, and, and things every second. That's great. And it is hard. It's hard. Oh, the one thing you can do though, which is really cool. If you go to our platform, we have a module called summarization. And if you take an article or a PDF and you, copy paste or in, ingest it into the platform and hit summarize to one page, you can take an 800 page document and summarize it down to one page. Um, and, uh, and and that shortens your reading cycle. May not take it totally off your off your plate, but it does shorten your reading cycle. So Ken, I know you're like me, um, birds of a feather, we're both techno optimists and I believe that we're rational optimists. We're not toxic optimists. We're on our feet are on the ground. So I've got a question from my partner Basir out of Turkey. And uh, he's asking about the dark side, Ken. There's always a dark yes. side. There's always a dark side. And, and you know why? His question is his question is if there is an evil AI, what well, what is it? So but go ahead. Um, so the uh, dark you, side. Yeah, you spell it H U M A N. Oh, picking on the so, four-legged friends. No, no, yeah, yeah. Well, well. So, so, so the interesting thing about AI is it does it points out some very interesting things about us as humans. AI AIs are true reflections of us, and so if you want to figure out what's wrong or where the the hazards are with AI, it is us. And until we figure out how to address us, there will always be a potential for a dark side. The important thing that I hope comes out of the relationships that we're starting to build with the machines and as a byproduct to each other is that we start addressing that part of it. Now, one of the interesting things, you know, they talk about, uh, you know, uh, the, the the fake videos and, uh, you know, and, and how do I know this is real and stuff like that. I think one of the one of the most interesting side pieces that comes out of all of this is that I think the travel industry is about to get a boom. And you're going to see more people traveling because when you go to close a million dollar deal, you want to look that person in the eye, shake their hand and watch them sign that piece of paper. Because DocuSign and, uh, you know, the, the, the fake videos that are going on, emails, all of that can be faked, whether you're using AI or not. Mm -hmm. And so I think the human connection that comes out of all this is going to be just as important as the connection between humans and the machines. That's uh, the dark side of it and the human side. It's like, uh, I share with uh, you the concern uh, about uh, dealing with humans because I've dealt with humans in computing for all my career. And they, they <laughs> tend to be the ones that go to jail. And uh, we have lots of powerful weapons and lots of powerful machines that you've got to be very careful about. Uh, we've got about five minutes. Yeah, we have five minutes uh, into the interstitial land. Thanks very much, Ken. This is a really great job. 
Uh, this is a book festival. I know you talked about three or four movies, and I love movies because I'm telling people the, the next movie they should watch if they don't get what's going on about conversational AI. Uh, yep. They should watch the 10 year old movie by Spike Jones called Her. Yes. Joaquin Phoenix, Scarlett yep. Johansson. It's a love yep. story. And when I look at what's going on right now, and I look at that switch where conversation was going to audio, and then ChatGDP just worked out its nice Bluetooth connection. So I walked around. I was walking home last night uh, from my uh, constitutional, and I decided to do an experiment, and I had a conversation for 30 minutes about my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And a voice in my ear, and they've had the speed glitches worked out yeah. and uh, it's fascinating but that movie's good so i'm going to switch gears though not movies what should we read what's the next book that you recommend this audience read one book i'm going to keep talking until you give me the sign because you're thinking one right. book that's going to be impressive to an audience informative and other than your book what should we read next um i i'm going to recommend it's an actually it's an older book and, and and just put on the lens of the filter of the title of my book and the sub and the subtitle. Uh, and it is a book called More Than Human. It's out by an author called uh, named Theodore Sturgeon. Um, it is it's one of the books I've read probably a dozen times over the years. Um, it it speaks of something that you know there, there's a term that they use in it that got a bad name for a while called homo gestalt but i believe that's where we're headed and homo gestalt is the next generation of of human evolution that is not singular it is the the actions and the the uh, uh the connections between a group of in this in the case of the book five uh individuals well there's a couple extras but it's basically five individuals and what they're able to accomplish together that they couldn't have accomplished individually. And that's where we're headed if we do this right. But read it. It's a fascinating book, um, you know, and it's it's interesting that it was written so long ago. Uh, it takes a little bit of getting into it. There's some bits, you know, bits and pieces, just like all books where there's some, there's a little bit of raciness in some of it. So I wouldn't recommend it necessarily for little kids to read, but mm -hmm. for an adult, you know, you know, use your own filters. That's great. Great recommendation. Theodore Sturgeon, great science fiction writer. Thank you so much, Ken, for participating with us at our, our second annual book festival. I'm Rob Tyree, and uh, we're going to stop this recording and then start it again. But thanks so much, Ken, and uh, really you. good job. We appreciate it. And...